Good afternoon and welcome to our What's Buzzing at Georgia Tech webinar series. My name is Tyler Barker. I am the coordinator within the Office of Parent and Family Programs here at Georgia Tech. We would just like to welcome you to a brand new uh, academic year and a brand new fall semester. Uh, we are having a good and a great first week here on campus. Uh, we know parents and family members are very excited as we enter into a new school year. Um, today we are joined by some very special guests for our Tech Talk with Dean Stein. Um, and so he'll just kind of give an overview and just some campus updates about what's going on on campus. You know, where should you where should you be in your headspace right now as a parent and a family member? And then we'll have a Q&A a chat session at the end. Um, please feel free to utilize our Q&A chat box. If you have any questions for Dean Stein at the end of the presentation, we'll be definitely sure to get to those as we can. And so now, without further ado, I will turn it over to our AVP and Dean of Students, Dean John Stein. Is you can it, go ahead and do. Okay, great. Just making sure that uh, it was a uh, recording. Uh, greetings from my office at Georgia Tech, and I'm pleased to be here today. And I have a very special guest with me, our new Vice President. Uh, for student engagement and well-being, uh, Dr. Lola Hong, and, and I'm going to have her introduce herself a little bit. Uh, but first, I just want to say that it, uh, I agree with Tyler. It's been a very exciting opening for us, and we'll say more about that. Um, but we appreciate you taking the time to spend some time with us, um, and you know, we'll review some basic stuff and hopefully uh, at the end answer some questions that you might have. But uh, this is really a TED Talk with uh, myself and Dr. Hong. So you, you have two, two good people here to really uh, spend some time with today. So let me ask Dr. Hong to introduce herself. All right, terrific. Thank you, Dean Stein. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say, uh, add my thanks to all of you for making the time to join us today. And I'm looking forward to meeting all the parents and family members of our Georgia Tech students in the coming months and semesters. So I'm on day 24 uh, of my journey here with Georgia Tech. So you can sort of consider me, I'm like the first year student. So I'm in my first year, I'm with the cohort. Uh, hopefully I won't ever graduate. I, I, and I can just keep on staying here and serving our students. Uh, but I am having an opportunity to sort of experience what it's like to navigate a new campus, uh, learn new people, get to know the Atlanta area, et cetera. And so definitely have an empathy uh, for what that experience is like of, of being a new person. So I'm really excited to join the team that's here at Georgia Tech, along with Dean Stein and all of our uh, many hundreds of employees, uh, all professionals that are here with one singular focus, and that is to really support uh, the success and well-being of your student. I was brought here to fulfill some very specific charges. I just want to share them briefly with you because I think as our family members of our students, they will be of interest to you. And over the coming months, I will probably be reaching out to get some of your thoughts from your perspective as individuals who support our Georgia Tech students. So first and foremost, we're combining a large number of programs and services that are student front facing into one combined uh, division. And it's the new division of student engagement and well-being. As part of that effort, our hope is that uh, our services, we have many, many high quality outstanding services, but in the, pa in the past perhaps could have benefited from a little bit more coordination or a little bit more consistency uh, across units. And so this combination of programs and services hopefully to facilitate so, so that we can sort of operate with one vision, one purpose, if you will, all in service to our students. The second piece that's really important is really creating an emphasis and a targeted focus on how we can promote the well-being of every single Georgia Tech student. I think this pandemic has helped us understand that if you don't have your health and wellness, it's really hard to be anything else, right? You can't be a productive employee. You certainly can't be an actively engaged student. And it can be a real hindrance to being all that you can be in terms of realizing your full potential. And so we recognize that Georgia Tech, like many institutions across the country, are grappling with our recovery from the pandemic and acknowledging that this has taken a toll on all of us, including many of you on this, on this call, uh, in terms of our uh, health and well-being. And it's uh, asked us, I think, to rethink how we can play not only an individual role in our own health and well-being, but also how we can contribute to a community ethic of health and care uh, for each other. 
So those are two major emphasis areas uh, that we have. And again, the focus is really on helping our students get the most that they can out of their Georgia Tech experience. I'll just share a couple things. Uh, this is my seventh institution uh, of working in, in higher ed. I have almost 30 years in the field. Uh, I started when I was 12. Uh -huh. Just kidding. <laughs> Uh, but I just wanted to share one point that I hope is reassuring, is that after having spent time, and I've been all over the country, so I started on the East Coast and just kept moving westward. Uh, I've been in uh, Wisconsin, Louisiana, uh, Arizona, Hawaii, California, you know, so all different parts of, of the country, truly. And one thing I will say is while every institution is unique, I definitely get that Georgia Tech students, Yellow Jackets, are very, very unique and very special in who they are and what they bring in terms of their excellence and their tremendous uh, capacity as human beings. But the other thing that I've learned is parents and family are the same everywhere, right? And so regardless of who the students are, you want the best uh, for your student and to the extent that you can be a part of being there for them, uh, we want to facilitate that. So that's, like I said, that's the one universal truth that I have found over my uh, experience in the field of student affairs. So uh, looking forward to engaging with you. I'll probably do more listening today. As as you know, I'm still learning my way at uh, Georgia Tech. And if there are any questions I can assist with or be of uh, support to you and your student in the coming months, I hope I can be there for you. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Hong. We are so looking forward to having you uh, join our Georgia Tech family and community. Uh, you've already done some great work, and we know you're going to do some much more great things under your leadership. So now what we'll do, parents and families, we'll shift it over to our PowerPoint presentation. Once again, if you have any questions, um, please feel free. Please feel free to utilize the Q&A chat box. Give me one second as we. Dean Stein, can you see? Uh, no, uh, no, it's not showing. No. Um, as yeah, Tyler's trying to, as Tyler's trying to sort this out, let me just say that, um, you know, we are in day two of the um, classes, and so, and we've just come off of a week of welcome. Um, so our students are back, and uh, we are all getting back into the routine of being together on campus. Uh, our faculty, students, and staff. And so, uh, you know, it's been a while since we've all been together, and uh, we are reconvening and working out the glitches of some things. So uh, we ask uh, students and we ask you to be patient with us as we uh, make some adjustments, and we will be making adjustments along the way. Um, you know, today what we want to do is just really uh, give you some basic highlights of things and then maybe uh, get into some of the questions that you have. Um, I always think it's important for you to have some sense of up, um, key dates that you need to be aware of. Um, and, you know, we are still in phase two registration. So we have received a number of emails from students and families, both on the academic side and here in uh, this division from uh, both of you, parents and students, uh, saying that, you know, you're still trying to, your a student is still trying to negotiate a, a full schedule or a complete schedule, a final schedule. And what I'll say is that this week, along with last weekend, is a very fluid time for us in terms of that. There are students moving in and out of classes. So it does require some patience in terms of uh, getting off the wait list, um, being notified of that, uh, finding the right section that fits. I'm, I'm teaching a, a GT1000 class this fall, and every day I go in, my roster's different. And that's because some students were taken off a wait list on another class, and 
opened a seat and then a new student has registered for the class. So it's a very fluid time uh, and we have until Friday to kind of sort it all out. Um, and faculty are aware of that. Faculty know that students are shifting. And so in this first week, uh, if for some reason uh, your student does not make it to that class for the first time, they can always go to the TA or to the faculty member's office hours or send the email and kind of get uh, caught up on what they may have missed. Okay, I, I know there's a lot of uh, stress around finalizing schedules right now. Um, the other important date is that August 30th is the payment deadline. Uh, please, please make sure that um, you meet that deadline. If you need to negotiate something beyond that deadline, uh, it would be important to do that with the Bursar's office uh, before the 30th. Um, we don't want students to lose their schedule uh, because of lack of payment. So just be aware of that uh, very, very important deadline. Okay. The first break that students will have will be September 6th, which is Labor Day, and that there'll be no classes on that day. Uh, so that's the first kind of relief that students will feel. It comes pretty quickly in the semester. Um, and so, And then uh, the other important date as we move into October is Family Weekend, which is October 1st through the 3rd. And I hope that many of you will be able to join us uh, for that experience. It is a wonderful experience, and we have uh, families from all over the country and world that actually come to it. And we also have families that uh, have decided to come four and five times, depending on how many years um, their student is with us. Um, I mentioned that we just came off of Week of Welcome. Um, that was uh, something we put in place a few years ago. Uh, it was, it's mostly for our new students, new transfer students and uh, first year students. This year we did invite second rising second year students to come in midweek. And it's a time to really, before classes begin, it's a time to just really connect with the community, connect with each other, explore the campus, learn the resources, and focus on kind of community building. And so we had uh, so many events on every day, both virtual and in person, that students could tap into. And I can tell you that on the events that I attended or heard about from my staff, uh, the response was wonderful. Students were really engaged and uh, willing to uh, come together and be a part of things. Uh, I do want to reassure you uh, that last week and going forward, we continue to speak to students about uh, wearing a mask, okay, uh, and the importance of that. However, there is no requirement, there's no mandate right now for that. Um, but I do want to say that most of our students are being very responsive to the request. And really, it's about protecting each other, protecting the community, uh, and the role that each of us can play in doing that. Um, key events from last week uh, was uh, a move-in experience that we hope really surpassed your expectation. It was well-organized, well-structured, and moved people through in a pretty quick process. We had a rock, ramble, and roll event where students gathered and um, was served a meal outside. Uh, we had yellow jacket mega mixers, which allowed students to come together and just be in each other's company. We had rats night, breakfast, silent disco, a movie night. And then on Sunday, we had the official opening of our academic year uh, with our president and other key leadership uh, within the Institute at Convocation. Uh, it's a wonderful event. Dr. Hong and I were there on the stage. It was a wonderful sight to look out and see so many of our students wearing their rat caps and uh, in the presence of each other. Um, we had a terrific rising second year speech and we had a wonderful uh, talk by our student body president and our provost and president. So uh, it's just a wonderful way to start the academic year and it's a great tradition um, here at Tech. I know they're still trying to call this up. Um, as we move into the semester, I do want to remind you of support. Yeah, if you could just keep going until we get to this slide. Um, CARE, which is our Center for Assessment, Referral, and Education, 
is a first step for any student that really wants to connect with mental health support or other resources on campus. Um, they can do it virtually, uh, the appointment, or they can do it in person. They can just drop in and connect with someone. Okay? It is the center that I think uh, we really want to make sure all of our students know about, and as families, we want you to know about. Uh, if your student is having a bad day, if they you know, just were on the receiving end of news that wasn't wonderful, whatever that news is, and they need someone to talk to, this is the place to do it. Okay? This is where they can come. Um, the Dean of Students Office, which is right in the same building, the flag building, Smith Gall Student Services Building, is also another area that they can come to. Uh, myself and the other deans have dean's appointments. I believe I have two this afternoon with students. And we, we really see over a thousand students in student appointments in a given academic year. Uh, and students can come in and they do for all kinds of reasons. We also have a referral system so that if there is a concern about a student by a faculty member, an academic advisor, a parent, a roommate, they can do an online referral and then we will do an intervention with that student. Uh, you're welcome to use that referral. You can also call the office and talk to us about it. If you want to re remain anonymous, we will um, respect that. And uh, really, the important thing is uh, what I say to students when they ask who referred me, uh, my statement to them is someone who cared enough. And, and we kind of leave it at that, just that there's a caring person that just wanted us to check in with you. Okay, so keep those two things in mind. From there, they would be referred to many, many different resources. Uh, it could be the Counseling Center. Uh, it could be the Health Center. It could be the uh, Center for Academic uh, you know, Support. There's so many different places depending on what the issue is and what the student is trying to problem solve or work on. Next slide, please. And as classes start uh, up and run, like we are, we really want to remind students to talk to their faculty, get to know their faculty, go to office hours. Um, faculty always say, John, I wish more students would come to my office hours. Um, and their TAs. These are the people in place for help. Okay? We have undergraduate academic services. We have academic coaching and exploratory advising if they decide that they're thinking about changing their major. Uh, we have tutoring available in person and online. And then we have peer-led undergraduate study plus sessions. Um, OMED is another place that they can go to for support and tutoring. Okay? And all of that can really be found on the Academic Success Resource website, which is listed there. Um, one of the hardest things I would say for tech students especially our new students, to admit is that they need help academically because they have been at the top of their game and their population of students that really always served in the role of tutor, not to T. And it is a hard journey to go to the other side of the table, but an important one sometimes. And so we want to normalize that. Um, and years ago, when I was running this program, I did a study and I asked the question, who comes to one-to-one -to -one tutoring and stuff? And lo and behold, the results actually were somewhat surprising in the fact that we had students who had four O's, we had students that were on scholarships that you know, had three fives and three O's and stuff. Um, it was students who were really being successful and wanted to maintain that success, not lose the scholarship. And then we had others who were struggling. So it's the full range, the full spectrum of students that seek the tutoring and help. And that's what we want to make sure that our students understand, is that you don't have to be in crisis and you don't have to be failing, right? You can just ask for some assistance um, to maintain the best grade that you're able to achieve in a course. So keep that in mind uh, as we move through the semester. Uh, and remind them, we remind them all the time, but sometimes they need to hear it from multiple people to uh, remember that it's there and to actually seek it out. The other thing I would say in relation to academic support is to do it early and quickly. Do not let something go on for months and months. Just kind of address it in the moment and uh, make it happen. Next slide. A little bit about COVID. 
Um, obviously, we are still in the midst of all of this. Um, we are keeping the community informed. Uh, there were a few different videos that went out today to students. One was from the president. Another one was from our um, medical doctor in our health center and answering some basic questions and giving some advice. Okay, we have a terrific testing program here that students should take advantage of on a weekly basis, okay, even if they're vaccinated. Um, I still go every week and get tested. Uh, I'm happy to say that last week when students arrived back for even week of welcome, we had over 2,800 individuals go through the testing program. Yesterday alone, we had 1,354. So students are responding to this. This is one very clear way that we can keep ourselves safe as a community uh, and they, they can kind of keep themselves uh, aware of their status and stuff. The vaccine eligibility expanded and is open to all community members. Uh, we are hosting vaccine clinics at the McCamish Pavilion. You can see the dates of August 23rd to the 25th and the 27th from 9 to 3.30. And then again in September 7th through 10th and the 13th through the 17th, 9 to 3.30. Okay, students uh, can come in. Uh, they don't need to have an appointment. They can just show up and uh, get a vaccine. Okay. Um, if they are not vaccinated and they want to be, um, they can obviously take advantage of this. Uh, it's right here on campus, it's free, uh, and it's easily available and accessible to them. And we will continue to um, inform students about this, uh, but I want to reassure you that um, we are keeping students very informed about these issues um, so that they are aware, and also, um, like everything else, uh, like just in terms of registration, the situation is fluid, it's changing. Uh, where we are today may not be where we'll be in a week. And again, I'm gonna ask your patience with all this as um, we, uh, as a university system, make decisions and things may change. But if they do, uh, students will be informed and uh, Lacey, will make sure that families are informed through her means of uh, communicating with you. Uh, but just know that we may not have all the answers because we're trying to shift and move uh, as we uh, things change, right? I believe now we can go into some questions. Uh, Dr. Hong, do you wanna add anything to anything I said? No, I thought that was a really good overview, um, but I can also see we have a lively <laughs> chat. I've been trying to yes. field some of them and, and reach out to resources on campus. Um, yes. I wonder if it might help to, to, yeah, okay. Yeah, I was gonna say, yes, we do have a lot of questions. Um, Dr. Hong, I think one of the first ones is for you that is in the event chat. Is your new position as head of student engagement and well-being? will this include the oversight of suicide prevention efforts and mental health um, and also as Dean Stein already spoke about our efforts to uh, with mental health but if you could just confirm that you oversee that. Yes I do um, and so I uh, my my master's degree is in public health and my first work in a university setting was with um, health promotion um, prevention and student health services. So this is an area very near and dear to my heart, and it's part of the reason I wanted to have this chance to work here at Georgia Tech, is this really uh, opportunity to, to lead a, a, a campus-wide effort involving our um, partners in the classroom, as well as all of our work outside of the classroom, to help not just recognize when students are struggling with a mental health disorder or um, stress or anxiety or depression, but to help make sure that we're able to create a culture that is supported from the beginning and doesn't contribute to exacerbating uh, various mental health concerns. And so we're gonna look at that whole spectrum um, and make sure that we're looking at it comprehensively and that there's a mind-body-spirit connection that really feeds into that. So yes, we'll, we'll definitely be working on that. Awesome, thank you so much. The next question we have is for Dean Stein. Uh, would Georgia Tech provide the flu vaccine as well for students this academic year? That's a great question, and the answer is yes. Uh, every year we have flu clinics. 
I don't have the dates for those yet, uh, but I know that Dr. Holton and his staff is also uh, planning on having flu clinics, yes. Yes, and we'll be sure to get those dates out to parents and our parent news, so definitely be on the lookout for those. Uh, Dean Stein, if my student is maybe a little shy and having uh, some tough times uh, meeting people and just, you know, getting him himself or herself out there, any advice for me as a parent to just encourage them and just to kind of help, you know, break that shyness and, and have an enjoyable experience? Yes, uh, it's a great, great point, great question. Uh, we, we know we have a number of students that uh, this doesn't come so easily to. Uh, too. And, um, and so what I would say is that, uh, you know, if, if you're really concerned and you feel like it's going on for an extended period of time, then you should contact us or put a referral in and we can speak to your student, okay? But know that um, in the first few days, students have to get acclimated to being here and to feel like they're in somewhat of control and just in terms of knowing where they need to be, their courses, and uh, where the buildings are and stuff, it is important for them to connect, okay? And so we, we have RAs that are trying to facilitate that in residence halls. If your student is a first-year student, one of the things I would suggest is to have them enroll in GT1000 freshman seminar. This would be a very easy way to meet a small group of students in a very kind of less threatening way uh, and, you know, and make friends and make connections, right? So, and then from there, it's a matter of thinking through what else am I interested in? And there's so many things at Georgia Tech that a student can connect, get connected to. We have over 500 organizations, we have intramural programs, um, you know, and what I will say is that I have many conversations with students around this issue, along with my staff. And so if, um, you know, need be, we can kind of have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your son or daughter and have them come in and talk about this directly with them, so. Awesome, thank you so much. This can be for either uh, Dean Stein or uh, Dr. Hong. We know that many of you uh, have questions and concerns about our dining halls with having ex extended lines and, and maybe perhaps the options and things of that sort. Uh, please know that we are aware um, of these things and that we have consulted uh, with our dining operations and team um, to address these uh, concerns as fast as possible. Uh, Dean Stein or Dr. Hong, if you would like to add anything as well, just as it relates to the dining. So uh, as I, <laughs> Dean Stein may have more, but uh, given that I'm still learning some of this, I will just share that there were a couple questions about whether dining dollars or the buzz card will be accepted at on-campus vendors. I was texting our associate vice president for campus services, um, and she has confirmed that those dollars should be accepted by our on-campus food vendors. So if your student is having difficulty with that, I put her email in the Q&A chat, um, and so hopefully viewers can see that. And so that, that sounds like there might be a, a glitch. So we apologize for that inconvenience, but that will help us uncover what the problem is uh, because they should be accepted uh, at the, the food vendors. And then I'm just waiting to hear back on the uh, dining hall closures. There was a question about timing on that. I don't know, Dean Stein, if you're aware uh, I'm not aware of that. So. My, so if you all see me on my phone, I'm not, not paying attention. I'm trying to call a lifeline to respond to your question. Yeah, awesome. great. Awesome. And please know, parents and families, as I just stated, that we will pass along all your comments, uh, questions, and concerns to our dining operations administrations team, so that way they can know the pulse of the parents and what's going on on campus. Uh, if a student feels sick, uh, to whom he or she can contact first at the campus? So if a student is feel, feeling ill, um, now it really depends on the time of day, right? So if it's during the work day, then the student would contact or go over if they're well enough to the health center and be seen at the health center, okay? If it's after hours, um, again, depending on how ill they are, uh, if they're in need of immediate attention, then what they would do is they would contact their RA or hall director 
let them know what's going on, and they would facilitate someone uh, coming to kind of check on them. It might be an EMT, um, you know, so, so there are ways that we can address this, but uh, during the day, go to the health center, in the evening, work with the after hours on-call systems. There's always a housing member on call, there's always a dean on call, and in cases when needed, there's always a, a therapist on call. So we have a wonderful on-call system here, and obviously GTPD is on, in place 24-7, 365. So. Who should students contact if the mode of delivery of their class changes from in-person to online? Yeah, great question, and we, and we are getting a number of those questions. Um, what they should first do is speak to their professor, even send an email, and ask why the mode is being changed, okay, to get clarification as to why the mode is being changed, right? If it's still a major issue, then Dr. Kyla Ross, and I'll put her name in the chat, but uh, she is the academic person who's working to resolve some of these issues between the student and the faculty member. Okay. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, another question here, will fall break in October definitely take place this year? That's our intention, that's our plan. And, and that, but as I said, you know, we're, we're in a fluid situation and things may change, but right now, the plan is that fall break will, will occur. And, and can I just piggy up back on that, that Dean Stein and, and Carla, uh, Tyler, there was another question about uh, that last fall after the Thanksgiving break, some campuses, uh, how should we say this, discourage students from coming back. This is a little bit related, I think, to this question about will fall break happen and to your point, Dean Stein, about that we need to be fluid. So I thought let's just answer that question as well. The answer is we don't know yet. And so this is one of the really difficult challenges for many of us working in higher ed, just as you in your places of employment and in your communities. We, this pandemic is shifting every single day. And so the reality of what is going on, how it's impacting communities, uh, not just here locally uh, in the Atlanta area, but the, the broader state. And then we also have to consider regionally. And for example, we have a large number of international students, what's happening in the, the global landscape. So we just want to ask for your understanding that it, it is hard, that we're not trying to evade the question, but sometimes it's difficult to know because we don't know where the pandemic would be. And I think none of us, right, if you asked us 18 months ago, could we imagine being in this unprecedented situation as a nation, as a world, uh, and what we're at? So we are going to continue to look at the science, continue to evaluate, and make the decision within the degrees of freedom that we have that we believe will help protect and promote the safety and welfare of our Georgia Tech community, including our students. So I just wanted to just say, we don't know yet what's gonna happen for Thanksgiving. Uh, Dr. Hong or Dean Stein can take this one. Um, is on-campus asymptomatic testing available for students that have their private insurance? The info I saw was testing was available for students with student health insurance. It, it, so is the question if the student does not have the health insurance, can they get tested? Is that what we're? Yes, basically, that, yes. Yes, they should go over to the health center and be tested. Yes. Okay, they can work with the insurance. And Dean Stein, just for the parents or family members who may have joined us late, um, will vaccines be offered all throughout this semester? Absolutely. There'll be, uh, the plan right now is that vaccination clinics will, will continue to happen. Awesome, awesome, great news. And now that the uh, Pfizer vaccine is FDA approved, will it be mandated on campus? I, you know, again, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna say to that is that, that that's relatively very new information and we have not had any guidance yet on that point. Um, we're waiting on, uh, whatever guidance is going to come, and as soon as we know, we will inform students and we will inform you, but we're, we're just not quite there yet. Yes, yes, very fluid. Um, if a classmate tests positive in the class, will students in that same class be informed? 
Good question. Generally, no. What will happen is that the student who did test positive will be contacted by a contact tracer who will try their very best to get the names of the students that the student may have interacted with uh, in the class, who they sat next to and stuff. And then if it's assessed that the student, the other students are at risk, they will be contacted by the contact tracer. If the student was in nowhere near the space of the student, then no, they would not be contacted. And no, we would not generally say that somebody uh, tested positive in class. And we had a great question earlier about just campus involvement, getting involved. Um, how can students sign up for student clubs and organizations? Um, and our director, Lacey Whedon, dropped a link in the chat, uh, which has all of our featured student organizations here on campus. Highly encourage your student to get involved. Um, it's a great way to meet people, uh, develop skills, and also just have enjoyable experiences outside of the classroom because a lot of our students grow just from the things that they can be involved in on campus. So highly, highly encourage student involvement. Great question. Yeah, and I also want to remind everyone that next Tuesday, the 31st, is the Involvement Fair. That's when many different organizations will be available to students to stop by a table, learn about the organization, sign up on a mailing list if they're interested. Uh, and they should go for the, stu your students should go to the Center for Student Engagement to find out more information about the involvement with there. And the next question we have, is contact tracing still being done? Um, do students have assigned seats in the classroom? The answer is yes, contact tracing is still being done. Um, it, it never stopped, honestly. We have continued to do it. Um, and uh, no, we don't have assigned seats unless the faculty member has set the course up that way. And honestly, I couldn't tell you how many of our faculty have chosen to use that model. Hey, Tyler. Hey, hey. Hey, it's, hey everyone. It's like, <laughs> uh, so one of the questions we have is about the post office. Do we have an update on the post office and kind of where we are with um, packages and families sending things? That's one of the questions that's in the box. I don't know if John or, or Dr. I can, well, I can provide perhaps an incomplete answer. It won't answer all of the timeline questions, but hopefully just understanding the why. So uh, I don't think I'm sharing anything that couldn't is we did have um, a fire uh, affecting our postal services facilities uh, and that happened right before the start of our semester. Uh, the good news is nobody was hurt uh, or injured so that's the most important aspect of it. But yes unfortunately the timing could not be worse and we recognize that it has impacted uh, mail receipt delivery package receipt delivery etc. So where we're at is that the ability to send was recovered more quickly. The ability to receive and distribute has been a little bit more difficult because that requires storage, et cetera, and then the distribution pathway. So I know that our campus has been working with US Postal Service to get up to speed, but because we lost approximately one week of time, it is taking us a bit uh, to recover. So we very much apologize and recognize that this has been an impact. Knowing this, if your package is not urgent, it may be prudent to wait a bit uh, for our post, our postal services to catch up. Uh, but if it's urgent, just recognize that we, we have a bit of a capacity issue now. So that's the why it was just unfortunate we couldn't have controlled what happened here. So we apologize for that, but that hopefully that can help explain what's going on. Great, thank you so much. Are you planning an educational webinar to address vaccination hesitancy? Uh, this will be beneficial for students and parents alike. It's a great suggestion, and we will take that back to Dr. Holton and now if, if that's something that we can. We've done it in the past, and so we could think about doing it again and host it on one of these kind of TED Talks. So. Just searching through the chat. Bear with me for more questions. 
I, I see a question about a rat cap and t-shirt for mm -hmm. rising second year. So what I would say is they should connect with new students and sophomore programs office, again, in the flag building on the first floor. Uh, they do have rat caps and um, they may have extra t-shirts and stuff. So yeah, I think they should go ahead and attempt to get that uh, this year, even though they uh, didn't get it last year. I, I know they have uh, more material down there. I know the supplies. So. Uh, Dean Stein, if a student uh, needs to quarantine due to a positive COVID test, does Georgia Tech have the capability to put them in quarantine housing? Yes. Um, again, we have our own number of beds on campus, and then we have contracted with two hotels off campus. As of this morning, we have nine students who are in quarantine. We're monitoring that on a daily basis, okay? But we do have right now sufficient beds. Um, and then if we need to add, we'll have to do that as time goes on. But uh, I'm seeing a question about uh, two, uh, a, a student has two doses of, I'm assuming the vaccine. So what might be the issue with the, the further Vaccination. So I believe that may be referring to the recent announcement by the CDC that they're going to be encouraging uh, a sector, a targeted population, uh, to get the third dose of, of uh, their COVID vaccine. So I want to clarify that at this time, there's no guidance that would affect the majority of our students. That guidance is very specific to people who have significant immunocompromised uh, medical conditions. So at this time, uh, I think our focus is, as is much of the country, really focusing on getting everyone all of their full doses of the original series of the vaccine. And then at a later time, we will follow the CDC guidance if that needs to be done more broadly. But again, unless your student is someone who fits in one of those categories of being extremely immunocompromised, uh, we're not at this point uh, uh, recommending or having that as part of our vaccination protocol. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Hong. Um, either one of you can take this next question. Uh, do you know the percentage of students or, and, excuse me, and the percentage of faculty and staff that have been vaccinated? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, this is, I mean, it's a tough question only because we know who went through the vaccination clinics here on campus and who was vaccinated here. We do not know for those faculty, staff, and students who may have been vaccinated someplace else. Okay, so we don't. It, I, I think it would be um, too too risky to put out a percentage, honestly. Um, you know, uh, and so we're not comfortable doing that. But uh, the response has been terrific on campus, uh, and you know, but I, I don't think we can go much further. Than I don't know if Dr. Hong was. I'm going to agree with you, Dean Stein. Yeah. I mean, we, I, I will be very transparent. We, I have numbers in my head that were, you know, obviously as a new vice president. But I agree with, with Dean Stein that uh, I would actually feel irresponsible sharing those numbers because those are incomplete sets. So, for example, I myself would not be captured in the numbers of faculty and staff who work on campus in terms of whether they were vaccinated or not, because I got my vaccine prior to coming here in another state. So I wouldn't be counted as having gone through Georgia Tech's vaccination or even in the state of Georgia. So I, I think we've been cautious about that. We have international uh, faculty and staff. We have a lot of folks from out of state. So I think what I think is important to emphasize for all of you as family members listening is that we're doing a really proactive effort to encourage vaccination and testing. And because we were blessed as an institution, being Georgia Tech, I coming from where I most recently was, I was came from the California State University system. I was impressed that Georgia Tech was able to institute and implement uh, a number of its own, grow their own solutions, right, for both vaccination and testing, which is very impressive. And I would say that accessibility, the ease of accessibility is a major facilitator for students, faculty, and staff to get it. So I do think 
that plays a part and certainly that ability I think is having a positive effect here uh, versus the campuses I most came from most recently serving. We weren't able to do that and some of our students had to go quite a bit to get the vaccine so that was a deterrent. So well if we get more definitive statistics we'll be happy to share but right now we don't have anything definitive that would be appropriate to share. I am, much. yeah, and I just want to, I'm noting there are a number of comments here about dining um, on two levels, both operational, and then I'm also hearing a theme about the role of dining in personal wellness and well-being. So I'm going to take both and I will be following up with uh, our team to make sure that we explore these fully and so maybe they can come up at a future time, but I, I won't be able to answer everything right now because I'm still learning uh, some of the operational pieces, but they, these are all well taken and these are very valid points. So I just want you to know that I'm reading them, I'm noting them, and they will not be uh, forgotten. So I will be following up on, on all of those regards, but uh, you're absolutely, dining is a key part of what health and well-being. Uh, Lacey, would you like to address uh, family? Yeah, so I saw a couple of questions about family weekend and slots being full. So I just wanted to kind of, for our, especially for our new families to kind of answer some of those questions. So family weekend occurs October 1st through the 3rd, and we have over 2,400 people who've already registered for family weekend, and normally we have about 3,000 people attend. So we're kind of trending past our normal numbers, which is great because we know families and students are so excited to be back on campus um, for that special weekend. Please know that the sessions that you're seeing that are full are mostly the college and school reception locations. And that is because with that volume of people, we don't have several ballrooms located all across campus to host numerous receptions that will hold two or three or 400 people. And students are actually in class on Friday, so we can't take up classroom space on Friday because they're in class. So we do what we can to accommodate all of the college and school receptions, but unfortunately, once they're full, we will take a wait list. So you can always email our office at parents at govtech.edu. But once they're full, there's very little wiggle room that we have to keep adding families to a space that's already kind of tightly packed for the college and school receptions. We are, as far as zip lining, we are asking the CRC to see if we can add a Friday night version of that. We are waiting to hear back if they have the staff to confirm a Friday night zip lining, uh, um, zip lining uh, experience. We know that Dean Stein's brunch is full for Sunday. We actually are working on a contract to add a second breakfast for Sunday morning called the Sunrise Breakfast. And as soon as we get contracts signed, which should be any day, we will advertise that that event we've added as well for Sunday morning. There are still plenty of tickets for football, there's still plenty of tickets for the tailgate, and there's still plenty of tickets for the College Football Hall of Fame. We actually bought out the entire building for the College Football Hall of Fame for Friday night. Buzz is coming, the cheerleaders are coming, and we will have that entire building just for Georgia Tech families. We've got the 360 camera that families can stand on a spot and the camera spins and takes a picture of the whole family. We've got two of those. It's gonna be a really fun evening and there's plenty of space for the College Football Hall of Fame on Friday night. So where we can add or, or expand, there's also the ballet on Friday night as well. If you're not interested in college football, you can go to the ballet with the, at the First Center with uh, Georgia Tech Arts. So there's still, I'm seeing, you know, you're kind of sold out of everything. That is certainly not the case. We still have plenty of room, but when it comes to the college and school uh, receptions, there is just limited capacity because there's limited physical space on campus for 3,000 people on a class day. So as you can understand, that's kind of where we are with that. But certainly other opportunities exist throughout the weekend, and we really do hope you come and join us. Thank you so much, Lacey. Uh, Dr. Hong and Dean Stein, uh, for, for those parents who may have joined us late, um, into the Q&A. Could you please reiterate um, if the new FDA approval will uh, make the Pfizer vaccine mandatory on campus? Well, I mean, I, I think I, what I said was that um, we're not sure about that. Uh, we're waiting on guidance from the university system office. And as soon as we have an update and guidance on that, uh, we will inform our students and families about it. Uh, it's just too premature to try and 
predict um, if that's going to happen. Thank you so much. Are there any yeah. plans to ask students uh, slash faculty to volunteer if they have been vaccinated um, so the Institute can get a better sense of the population that is vaccinated? Yeah, we, we have asked them. So anyone who uh, receives a vaccination can go into the portal on or off campus. Now, if it's on campus, we have that information, but if they get it someplace else, they can go into the portal within the health center, even as a faculty or staff member, and note that vaccination and when it occurred, okay? Students can do that. Uh, first year students were asked to note it on their health form, uh, and many of them did. Uh, but and returning students, that question obviously was not on the health form in the past. So again, it's uh, as new information comes in. So any student can report it, any faculty and staff member can. Um, but I also want you to understand that you know we're, we're, we're in the midst of it still, and our goal is to focus on vaccines and having students vaccinated, faculty and staff testing, and to may, remain present in the moment of what we're trying to accomplish the highest priority, um, and that's to keep the community safe. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then, Dean Stein, if you could also just repeat the name of our colleague who is responsible uh, to kind of help students out if they had a class in person that was moved to online. Yeah, I put it in the chat, but it's Dr. Kyla, K-Y-L-A, Ross, R-O-S-S. And she works out of the provost office. And she deals with kind of, uh, her title includes conflict resolution. So any issue that emerges between a class and a faculty member and individual student and stuff, uh, Dr. Ross is the person that students would reach out to um, and talk through whatever's going on. Can you, can you emphasize masking on any such events uh, since things are still bad in various communities um, in the country and people will travel? Um, it will just ensure the consistency uh, within the academic school year for educational efforts. Yeah, and again, I, I want to reassure you that we are emphasizing it on every event and every situation, in classes, outside events, public events, inside buildings. We're mm -hmm. doing it all the time. We're handing them out, right? We're we're, handing them right, out. we're handing them out. Faculty have them in class. A faculty member this morning at the task force meeting reported that yesterday she gave out 50 in a class of over 200. Uh, 50 uh, students didn't have one, but wanted one. And those supplies are at the in the classroom that the faculty member can hand out. Uh, the good news there is that was that about 150 students came already with a mask on for class. So we are doing it. I want to reassure you very, very much. It's part of the educational uh, messaging that's going on here. And I think, you know, on top of that, we're also messaging two other things. Uh, at the same time, which is the importance of getting vaccinated and the importance of getting tested on a regular basis. So the other question that came right after this one about masking is, uh, if a student is vaccinated, should they still be tested? We are encouraging people to do that for a variety of reasons. Um, and, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity, I think, for us to think about how do we come to terms with what this pandemic, I think, has asked us to think about which is this pandemic to respond has really required us to not just think about what we do to take care of ourselves, but we have to think about what we can do to take care of other people. And that in many ways to take care of the public's health, it relies on individuals uh, not just doing what is best for them. So if I'm vaccinated, it does reduce the likelihood that I will become seriously ill or be hospitalized if I am in fact infected with the COVID-19 virus, any strain. The challenges that we're finding with more of the data, many of you are following the news as well, and I get that we all have different news sources, but the general consensus is that even if you're vaccinated, you can still have a viral load uh, with COVID-19 infection. And with that viral load means that you have the ability to pass that virus on to others who may not be vaccinated, or what's more important, with children under 12 who cannot vaccinated or people who are more immunocompromised 
uh, may still be more vulnerable even with the vaccine. So we are encouraging that even if you're vaccinated, that you should still get tested. And that isn't necessarily for you. That's for aloha, as we say in Hawaii, aloha for others in your community or in your family uh, so that you can be aware if you've been uh, exposed and can take proactive steps uh, to alert people so that they can, can take care of themselves. So that's, I think, our three-pronged approach and, and really trying to emphasize this is a not just what my rights and responsibilities are, but how can I be part of taking care of the whole community? Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Hong, and thank you so much, Dean Stein, for just taking the time out your schedule to be with us here today. Um, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email our office, parents at gatech.edu. We'll be sure to pass those along to the appropriate um, offices and programs entities. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. We do have a, another webinar this Thursday at 2 p.m. with our Campus Safety and Awareness, which will be hosted by our Georgia Tech Police Department. So definitely, definitely please join us for that. Um, our chief is very, very much looking forward to meeting you all. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a great day. And also please know this will be recorded and posted to our website within 24 hours. Um, so you can rewatch it again. We know that a lot of great information was shared here today. Thanks so much and go Jackets.